speaker is the chairman of Pro English, Dr. Rosalie Petalino Porter. Dr. Rosalie Petalino Porter is the author of three books, American Immigrant, My Life in Three Language, Languages, Fourth Tongue, The Politics of Bilingual Education, and Language and Literacy for English Learners, Grades 7 through 12, four programs of proven success. Dr. Porter is one of the founders of the Reed Institute and editor of the scholarly journal Read Perspectives from 1993 to 2001. She began her professional career as a Spanish-English bilingual teacher in the Springfield, Massachusetts public schools. She then headed the bilingual ESL department and was acting assistant superintendent for the Newton, Massachusetts public schools. More recently, Porter has served as an expert witness in court cases relating to the education of non-English speaking children in Arizona, California, New York, and Texas. She has delivered public lectures on language and education policies for immigrant children under the sponsorship of the U.S. Department in Bulgaria, China, <coughs> Finland, Israel, Italy, Japan, and Turkey. She is an expert witness on behalf of the state of Arizona in Florida's B. It's, yeah, in, in the case of Flores v. Arizona, a case in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Arizona, this was in 2009, citing Dr. Porter's important work. She holds undergraduate and graduate degrees, a B.A., magna cum laude, a master's in education, a doctorate in education from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She spent a year as a visiting scholar at the University of London, and she was a research fellow at the Radcliffe Institute, from 1987 until 1988. Uh, the Fulbright Commission of the U.S. State Department appointed Dr. Porter to a lectureship on English language teaching in Rome, Italy for the 1992 to 1993 year. In 1997, she was awarded a research residency at the Rockefeller Study Center in Villa Sur Bologna, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but in Lake Como, Italy, as a child, Porter arrived in the U.S. at the age of six, not knowing a word of English. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rosalie Pedalino Porter. Thank you. That sounded like a pretty important person. I don't know who he was talking about. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and very happy to be closely and, and forcefully involved in the movement to make English the official language of this country. And I will say right at the beginning, uh, this is not to devalue other languages. I am very proud to speak three languages well and two other languages fairly well. I believe in the value of any human being knowing more than one language. But I also believe in this multi-ethnic, multilingual country of ours, having one official language is so very important. As many of you will know, <laughs> thank you. And the idea of multiculturalism it would seemingly have been invented in the 1960s, but in fact, this country has been multicultural for centuries. We've always had many languages, many cultures, many ethnic groups represented. But it wasn't until the 19th, and oh, and the original ideal that held sway, at least until recent decades, was that we welcomed newcomers. Well, sometimes we didn't welcome them very much, but we expected, and newcomers expected, that they would adapt and adjust, learn our language, learn our ways, learn our history, and become full participating members of this society. Beginning in the 1960s with two important pieces of legislation, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, 
we now had a new ideal, and that was that we are a nation divided by law temporarily into groups. And the five official groups that were described at that time by the federal government were African Americans for whom the Civil Rights Act was passed and for whom the original idea that we must have temporary special help it was designed for this group. But the federal government added a few other groups that were to be given preferential status. A new word was invented, Hispanics. This encompassed people from 35 different countries who shared the Spanish language. Asians were another protected group. Again, a group representing many, many different languages and cultures. American Indians were the fourth group. And of course, we know American Indians are made up of various groups with different languages and cultures. The fifth group that was entitled to no special benefits was, was called whites. And that group includes many ethnicities and languages and cultures. Well, what was the purpose of delineating these groups? I guess a way of describing us, but it's not a very good way of describing us. My er area in this is the education part. When I was ready to complete my undergraduate degree, and I thought I would like to be a professor of Spanish language and literature. That's what I majored in. But I heard about a new idea that was set forth to help immigrant children. And since I came to this country, my family brought me here when I was six years old and didn't know a word of English. And I sat at the back of a classroom in Newark, New Jersey, understanding nothing, and there was no special help, I thought, I am going to sign on to this new education program. And it was called Bilingual Education. The federal government, in fact, in 1968, passed the first Bilingual Education Act. And in the very language of the law, it said, this is not to support any particular language. It is to help Mexican kids learn English, which was a fine goal. But of course, it was expanded and totally changed in the practice. <coughs> the first Bilingual Education Act was passed by my state of Massachusetts, and you know the biggest industry in Massachusetts is education. We have a lot of universities and colleges, and we think we're pretty smart. But we created this monster. We created this law that required any city with 15 or 20 children who came from a different language-speaking family that the city must teach these children in their native language with the idea that in a few years these children who are being taught in Spanish five of the six hours a day will learn their school subjects and they will get some 30 or 40 minute English lessons and in three years they will have learned English well enough to be completely comfortable in an, in an American classroom. Well, I joined this insane idea, and I became a bilingual teacher, but I soon discovered that the idea didn't work. So, soon I became a critic, and I had the opportunity to advocate for the English language to be taught to our children, and by the way, 
This group of children now numbers five million. We have five million children in this country who arrive in the classroom without a full knowledge of the language of the classroom, the community, and the country. And they cannot easily take advantage of educational opportunities. So this is how I became involved in this arena. The 1965 extension of the Voting Rights Act, by the way, the Voting Rights Act also imposed a rather costly unfunded mandate. Any voting district in which 5% of the citizens speak another language must provide voting ballots in two languages. The, the fact is, when we say multicultural, multilingual, 60 to 70 percent of the non-English speakers in our country speak Spanish. But the other 30 percent speak any one of 327 other languages. Is there any way that an educational institution can provide? Here's an example. The district where I became director of the bilingual programs had children from 30 different language backgrounds. State law required we should be teaching every one of these groups in their native language, Japanese, Hebrew, Italian, Chinese, Spanish, etc. Well, it was impractical and impossible. I worked...